Thank you, that's awfully nice. I think you're the first audience that's ever clapped. For me, that is, so yeah. Uh, thanks for coming tonight. Um, so welcome to the award-winning Westport Library, a five-star library. I'm very proud to be a, a member of the Board of Trustees. I'm Andrew Wilk, in case you don't know. Um, so this is part three of our series on, on cardiac care. How many of you attended one or both of the first sessions? Oh, there you go, that's fantastic. There will be a test and you'll be very well prepared. <coughs> Uh, so this is uh, part of a coronary artery series that uh, we've called Taming America's Number One Killer, which I think sounds like a reality show, but I, you know, Bob, I think we gotta rename it. Oh, it's over tonight, isn't it? Uh, so to recap, one in four deaths in the United States is due to coronary artery disease. Part one, our doctors discuss the risk factors, including cholesterol, its impact on cardiovascular disease, and its current management. Doctors Altbaum, Dreisman, and um, Pollock reviewed the presentation management and new technologies used to treat coronary artery disease. In part two, our doctors focused on the advanced treatment of atrial fibrillation, very common problem. Uh, in tonight's third and final session, we'll focus on the remarkable progress made in diagnosing and treating heart valve disease. Once a disease requiring open heart surgeries, strides in heart valve disease treatment uh, represent amazing breakthrough, breakthroughs in non-surgical non uh, technologies. Dr. Altbaum will give us an overview in the, in the anatomy of the heart. Uh, joining us tonight is Dr. Mitchell Dreisman from Cardiac Specialists. My friend in Fairfield, also from Cardiac Specialists, is Dr. Sharak Shah. Did I get that right? Oh, good. Okay, thank you, Dr. Shah. Uh, Dr. Shah will discuss what happens uh, to a patient when the heart anatomy is impaired and will focus on aortic stenosis and mitral regurgitation. Emphasis will be on the extraordinary new non-surgical methods of treatment. Dr. Altbaum, host of this series, recently retired from his practice of, at Internal Medicine Associates of Westport. He was a senior attending physician at Norwalk Hospital where he currently teaches. Dr. Altbaum received his uh, medical degree from Harvard U Medical School and completed training at Mass General and Yale New Haven Hospital. Dr. Altbaum will provide more formal introductions for our other two speakers tonight. So please welcome Dr. Altbaum and our other wonderful physicians. Thank you. Thank you. Well, thank you all for coming out tonight to the third of a series of cardiovascular lectures conceived of by Andrew Wilk and supported by the Westport Library. Uh, my name is Bob Altbaum, as you said, I'm pleased to be the moderator for this evening. I think uh, we all know that cardiovascular disease is the number one killer in the United States. And I think what a lot of people don't realize is that valve disease, as opposed to just coronary artery disease, is really a significant contributor to that frightening statistic. Two and a half percent of the general population has valve disease. And if you're over 75, that incidence goes up to 13%. And basically, heart valve disease is a contributing or a cause of 25 to 27,000 deaths annually. So it's a serious, serious problem. And our featured speaker tonight is Dr. Shrag Shah, and uh, he is an expert in structural heart disease, and he will be speaking to us about the major advances of heart disease. I'm going to speak about basic anatomy and some basic overview. He will talk about kind of drill down to the really important and newer ways of treating it. And then we'll have a question and answer period and be joined by Dr. Mitchell Dreisman. I just want to give you their credentials because they're impressive and you should know them. Uh, Dr. Dreisman received his medical degree from Brown University, completed three years of residency at Tufts New England Medical Center, finished his cardiology training at Mount Sinai Medical Center, and is now the president of cardiac specialists in Fairfield. And Dr. Shah received his medical education at Stony Brook and then completed a residency at Yale New Haven Hospital. He then went and did cardiology training in Yale New Haven Hospital. And if that wasn't enough, he then did a fellowship in structural heart disease and interventional heart disease. I think he's qualified to give the talk. So we're gonna get right to it and we're gonna talk about heart valves. And one of the questions is, what are heart valves? What do they do? And you'll probably notice this is a homemade slide. I can't say how primitive it is, but I, I, I take pride in its primitiveness. Anyway, this is a slide that basically is gonna discuss the circulation and the chamber of the heart. This represents one chamber. The heart obviously has four chambers, but this is to give you why we need valves and what can go wrong. 
Basically, if you take this chamber in the center, the balloon, and you just contract it like any other that the heart does, blood's going to go both ways. And the net result is no blood goes anywhere. It just pops out, comes right back. We have to direct that. We have to direct the valves. And the way we do that is with little doors, which we call valves. And they give the dire direction to the blood. They're unidirectional valves. Valves make the blood go one way. So if this heart contracts, this valve opens, allows blood to go through because of the pressure of the contraction opens it up, but it also closes this valve. So blood can't go back. The end result is blood goes one way when the heart contracts. And when the heart relaxes, same thing happens. Blood go can't go back because this valve now shuts and this relaxes so blood can flow through this new open valve. So the valves open and close and because they're unidirectional, blood only goes in the direction we want. It's, it's a net positive. Otherwise, basically we would not be generating any blood flow at all. Now, this is a simple chamber, but this is what the heart is kind of schematically looks like. But it's really the same thing. It's just four chambers doing exactly what that one chamber did. Blood basically comes back from the circulation, goes out to the, comes back after it's given oxygen and nourishment to the body, comes into the right side of the heart because the heart has four chambers, two upper chambers called the atrium, two lower chambers called the ventricle. Comes back to the right side of the heart and goes through this valve, this door, called the tricuspid valve, and into the right ventricle. So that valve is now open. That's what it does, it opens up. But when the ventricle contracts to push blood, instead of pushing blood backwards, that valve completely shuts, and it pushes blood instead out the pulmonary valve, which will open towards the lungs. So in the right atrium, into the right ventricle, out the pulmonary valve, into the lungs, and that's where the blood gets its oxygen but it's really the same chamber concept. Then blood gets its oxygen, returns to the left side of the heart, the upper chamber called the left atrium, goes through the mitral valve into the left ventricle. What happens? Left ventricle contracts, the mitral valve closes, and blood now only goes one to ray out the aortic valve to the large vessel of the heart, the aorta, and then it feeds the rest of the body. It's a pretty simple but extremely elegant system Nature did a very good job of designing valves, and it only goes one way. So you can imagine if things go wrong. The valves themselves look a little bit like this. They're not like little doors that I drew. They're much more elegant, uh, and they're made of very thin but very tough tissue, and often they're tethered to the heart, so when they do close, they don't overclose. They don't swing wide open. And, but it's a very nice system. Everything works uh, in a system to make the blood go forward. As I mentioned, there are four valves. Between the right atrium and the right ventricle is the tricuspid valve. Every one of those, these little sections is called a leaflet or a cusp. And they're like little doors, but they all work together to make the effect of opening and closing. So that's your tricuspid valve. Then the blood goes out through the pulmonic valve. Again, three cusps or three leaflets. Comes back through the left atrium, through the mitral valve, which only has two cusps, and then out into the aorta. And that is basically how the heart directs blood, and that's how the heart really works. Now, what can go wrong? A lot can go wrong. The valve has to open completely, and the valve has to shut completely. If something prevents it from opening and closing properly, we have an issue. And there are only two things that commonly go wrong. There are lots of things that cause them to go wrong, but there are only two things. One is the valve gets too narrow, gets too thick, or it gets calcium and can't open. The hinges of the valve don't work. So basically you've got a creaky door that can't open completely. And that's called stenosis right here. So there's a normal valve. That looks pretty nice, wide open. Could, can you imagine trying to squeeze blood through that? It's very tough. And I think a, an analogy you can make is to a hose. Here's your hose, very easy, don't need a lot of pressure. The hose gets narrower, narrower, and narrower. As the valve is getting narrower, you need a greater head of pressure. The end result is the heart has to work much harder, has the muscle, it's almost like lifting a weight. It gets thicker, and eventually, it may just fatigue. It can't do it anymore, and you develop heart failure and the symptoms that Dr. Shah will talk about. The other, the other thing that can go wrong is the valve, instead of not opening, when it shuts, 
it doesn't stop the blood from going backwards. So now you have a leaky valve. Valve is, blood is going backwards where it should only be going forwards. And that's called regurgitation. So here, again, the valve should be shut closed, but instead, it's not allowing blood to just stop. Blood is going backwards. So now you have blood going forwards and blood leaking backwards at the same time. It's it should be going back. It's coming the wrong way. Well, what does the heart have to do? Well, the heart has to pump a certain amount of blood to the body. And the way it does that, it has to compensate. So all the blood that's going back, it has to pump extra blood forward in order to compensate for the amount going backwards. That puts a big strain on the heart too. That's a lot of volume. And the heart begins to swell or dilate. It has to accommodate all that volume. But again, eventually, it just can't do it. It starts to decompensate. It can't do the work. Again, symptoms begin. But these are mechanical problems. It's not the muscle that's a problem. It's just the valves putting strain on the muscle. And that's what, why heart valve disease is a separate entity unto itself. Now, Dr. Shaw may want to review this in a, in a little bit more detail. I'm not going to go into it. But these are, this is just some of the diseases that cause aortic valve disease. We know the aortic valve has three cusps. They can get narrow, called stenosis, as I said, or they can leak regurgitation. A lot can go wrong. A lot of things happen. So when a doctor sees a patient and diagnoses a valve problem, they not only have to diagnose the valve and the severity, they also try to diagnose the cause. Because again, you want to correct the cause as well and find out what's going on. So let's talk about the consequences in a very simplistic way. What can happen? Again, aortic stenosis, the heart is working very hard. And eventually, it can't do the job. In regurgitation, blood is going back. The heart has to pump more and more volume as the leak gets worse and worse. And eventually, it's exhausted, just can't do it. So as you can imagine, three, three or four things can happen. If you can't pump blood through that narrowing, or you can't pump, pump enough blood to compensate for the backflow, the forward flow of the heart, the output of the heart begins to fall. And what happens when the output falls? Blood pressure may drop. You try to walk up a flight of stairs, you just don't have the energy. There's not enough blood getting to your muscles. Then you get lightheaded. On extremes, you can black out. But a lot goes wrong when the forward flow is not able to compensate. Then the other things, the heart has to use a lot of energy. It's working much harder than it was programmed to do. Heart was supposed to have these valves just flipping open and it's struggling now to open and close. So what happens is the heart muscle begins to use more oxygen and sometimes it'll actually require more oxygen when it's exercising than it can actually get from its own arteries. And you can get chest pain. We talked about that the first uh, lecture. You can get angina and discomfort in your chest. And finally, the last thing the heart wants to do is pump blood out of the lungs. Blood's coming back from the lungs. Well, now we know it can't go forward. It's getting, you're getting tired. You're getting chest pain. And now it can't pump the blood out of the lungs to the rest of the body. What happens? Blood begins to back up. It's like you stepped on a hose. It's backing up. Well, if it backs up into the lungs, the lungs get heavy. They fill with fluid. You get congestive heart failure. And congestive heart failure, you have heavy, boggy lungs. Fluid may go into the air sacs, and you have trouble breathing. This is a lot to go wrong from a single valve. And finally, you put a lot of stretch on the heart, and sometimes that often causes the heart to be ticklish, and we get various heart arrhythmias. These are all due to simply mechanical problems affecting the muscle and the flow of blood. So the symptoms make sense when you really think about it. The symptoms are backing up, shortness of breath, a thing called orthopnea where you can't really, you have to sit up, a paroxysmal nocturnal dyspnea, you wake up in the middle of the night when your lungs are filling with fluid, you have to breathe, sit at the edge of the table. You get tired because of the forward flow, you can get chest pain as we talked, swelling of the legs, blood is backing up in the whole body, you get lightheaded because you're not getting enough forward flow, and as I mentioned, you stretch the heart, it begins to get ticklish, it begins to beat irregularly, and you get palpitations. These are all common side effects of heart valve disease. The other thing you get are certain physical findings. And again, not surprisingly, if your lungs are filling up with fluid, you might get sounds in your lung called rowls. You might, uh, you'll always hear as blood is going through the, not always, as, as blood is going through the valve, the, bl the blood normally goes through very smoothly. 
very smoothly. And the opening and closing of the valve is what creates our heart sounds, that lub-dub. It's just valves opening and closing, opening and closing. You hear it when you listen with your stethoscope. But when the blood is being pushed through narrow holes or backflowing, it creates a lot of turbulence. And you hear turbulence as a heart murmur. So the first sign to a doctor that you may have a problem, you walk in, you're a little short of breath, your legs are a little swollen, doctor listens to your heart and finds that indeed you have a sound in your heart, a heart murmur. That may be the earliest sign. Obviously, these are all common signs of heart failure, findings on exam as opposed to symptoms. You might not notice these, but the doctor would. And then he would get into basically doing some tests. Dr. Shah is gonna go into this a little bit more detail, but things that you're all familiar with. Cardiogram, which is an electrical monitoring of your heart muscle. If the heart muscle is getting bigger, there are changes in the electrical signal. You'll see that on an EKG. Chest X-ray. The chest X-ray, if your heart is dilating because of too much volume or it's getting thicker, the heart begins to look larger on a chest X-ray. If it's backing up and fluid is filling up, the X-ray, instead of being clear, shows fluid in the lungs. Very common. An echocardiogram, which is the most important test, because you basically are bouncing sound off the heart muscle. It's reflecting back, and it's almost like you're drawing a picture. You can almost trace out the heart, and you can trace out the valves. And you can see the disease valves. And the echocardium is really important. And these are more specific tests if you're thinking about going further with possible surgery and procedures. But these are very important. Now, years ago, well, let me just say that not everybody with heart valve disease needs anything. Many people have mild stenosis, mild regurgitation. The heart does a great job of correcting it. You go 30, 40 years, never bothers anybody. And you know, when it's your time, you die of something else. But you don't die of heart valve disease. It doesn't necessarily mean anything. But as I said, 25,000 people a year succumb to this disease because once the valve becomes truly symptomatic, things tend to happen very quickly. Once the heart can no longer compensate, people start falling off a proverbial cliff, and it really does impact profoundly on longevity. Uh, when I started practice, the only treatment was open heart surgery. Major surgery, big time problems, Really, a, 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 you really had to select your patients. A lot of older people who make up 13%, they have 13% of heart valve disease in older patients, couldn't get the surgery. Many of them succumbed to it. Today, honestly, I feel we're living like in a golden age of heart valve treatment because the treatments are now non-invasive. They can be done through catheters, and they really are life-saving at almost any age. And with that cue, I'd like to introduce Dr. Shah. Um, thank you very much, Dr. Altbaum. That was a really great summary of heart valve disease and a good overview. Some of the stuff that I might say may be a little bit repetitive, but you know, repetition is typically good in the field of medicine. Is this better? Okay. Um, some of the stuff that I might say may be a little bit more repetitive. Uh, I'm just gonna start off by going over some of the stuff that Dr. Altbaum said. Repetition tends to help, uh, so that, you know, let's just start. So uh, basically, like Dr. Alpbaum said, we're gonna talk about minimally invasive approaches to valvular heart disease. Historically, um, val valvular heart disease was treated with open heart surgery, and in the last 10 to 15 years, we've really come a long way in trying to replace surgery with minimally invasive options, which are a lot more which offers a better recovery time and less complications for patients and offers these procedures for the elderly who would otherwise be non-surgical candidates. Um, I have no disclosures to go over. And my outline for today's talk really is gonna focus on two of the heart valves that Dr. Altbaum mentioned, the aortic valve and the mitral valve. And we're gonna talk about aortic stenosis, which he mentioned is a failure of opening of one of the heart valves, the aortic valve and mitral regurgitation, which is a failure of the mitral valve from closing properly. This is a much more basic review of the uh, slide that, of the, this is a much more basic review of the anatomy of the heart, but kind of refocusing on what we're talking about is the aortic valve and the mitral valve over here. 
The, aer the aortic valve is the valve that's located between the left ventricle, as Dr. Altbaum mentioned, which is the major pumping chamber of the heart, and the aorta, which I like to call the I-95 of the heart, especially because we live in Connecticut. Um, it basically delivers blood everywhere to the body. It goes to the brain, to the kidneys, to the muscles, so on and so forth. The aortic valve opens to allow blood to leave the left ventricle and closes to prevent the blood from backflowing into the ventricle. And aortic stenosis, as he mentioned, is a failure of this valve to open correctly, causing the heart to work a lot harder, which the heart doesn't like to do. It can cause things such as heart failure, as he mentioned. The mitral valve is the valve located between the left atrium and the left ventricle. And this valve is supposed to open to allow blood to go, for oxygenated blood to go from chamber one to chamber two so that the blood can actually pump out to the body. The failure of the mitral valve from closing properly causes fluid to backflow back into the left atrium, which can lead to the congestive heart failure that Dr. Albaum was discussing. So to start off with aortic stenosis, again, as he mentioned, th this is what an aortic valve is supposed to look like. You have three nice leaflets that are thin and pliable structures. And once you have a deposit of calcium starting to build up on the aortic valve, it can start to cause it to open poorly. And once it opens poorly, the heart can't function. So it's basically a, you know, the most common cause of aortic stenosis is calcific aortic stenosis, which is buildup of calcium on the aortic valve. There are other less common uh, causes that he mentioned, which typically don't apply to um, US population. As he mentioned, it's a very common diagnosis. Aortic stenosis affects about 12% of the people above the age of 75. And overall, the population at risk for aortic stenosis continues to increase as uh, time goes on. It's estimated about the elderly population will double between now and to the year 2050 to about 80 million in the world, which 12% of those people would have aortic stenosis. So it is a very common, one of the most common cardiac disease processes that can happen, especially in valvular heart disease. As he mentioned, aortic stenosis is a progressive disease. The heart valve starts off healthy, and then you can get mild aortic stenosis, which means that the valve is opening well, it's just not opening perfectly well. The problem with aortic stenosis is that it's progressive. Once you have mild aortic stenosis, it's only a matter of time that it progresses to moderate and then eventually to severe. That time frame varies in most people. Uh, it can be anywhere from 10 years to 15 years to as short as seven years, and it really does vary. And it's monitored basically by yearly ultrasounds of your heart, which are the echocardiogram. But what we do know is once you do have mild aortic stenosis, it, it will continue to worsen to severe at some point. <clears throat> As we mentioned before, and aortic stenosis is very common, and a lot of people with aortic stenosis are undertreated nationally, mainly due to the lack of the diagnosis of the disease process. So going into aortic stenosis a little bit more detail, this is kind of what ends up happening with aortic stenosis. With severe aortic stenosis, people can, even with severe aortic stenosis, people can be relatively asymptomatic until for a short period of time. And once you, as long as you don't have symptoms of aortic stenosis, your overall mortality is actually pretty, is okay. But once you start developing severe symptoms that correlate to severe aortic stenosis, your mortality, as Dr. Albaum said, basically goes over a cliff. Your overall survival once developing, after you start developing symptoms, reduces to about 50% in the next two years. And the symptoms, as he mentioned, which we'll discuss in a little bit more detail, are either chest pain, passing out, or heart failure. Once you have heart failure symptoms, which are shortness of breath, swelling of your legs, that, can, that basically causes your mortality to reduce dramatically within the next two years of uh, symptom onset, which is why it's extraordinarily important to have treatment options for a severe aortic stenosis. The symptoms Dr. Alpbaum touched on uh, basically focus around, th they're very vague symptoms. So the problem with symptomatic aortic stenosis really is that, you know, it's a disease process of the elderly. And a lot of these symptoms people misunderstand by normal signs of aging, which they don't always are, aren't always normal signs of aging. Things like fatigue, 
shortness of breath when you're shortness of breath when walking up a flight of stairs or walking along the beach, chest pain, difficulty walking long distances and feeling like you're not getting enough oxygen to your body, be not doing certain activities just because you don't have the energy of doing that could all be signs of severe symptomatic iridic stenosis. So the way to diagnose aortic stenosis and the assessment of it really starts off with seeing a doctor and a doctor listening to your heart. When someone says you have a murmur, that usually is a sign of one of the heart valves not working properly. Murmurs don't just happen, They're, they happen because either the valve is not opening well or valve is not closing properly. Once you have a murmur, that kind of leads to other tests that a physician would do. Things like Dr. Alpaugh mentioned, electrocardiogram, where when you have a murmur, that can start causing electrical issues within the heart that can be detected by a very simple test, which is an echo electrocardiogram. The chest x-ray that he mentioned where the heart can appear enlarged or we, if it's severe symptoms, you can start developing fluid that can be detected on the chest x-ray. And the gold standard of diagnosis of aortic stenosis is really echocardiography, which is the sound wave that Dr. Alpbaum was mentioning. For echocardiography, it's, it's basically an ultrasound. It is an ultrasound of your chest and it allows us to actually look at the heart and look at all four valves in detail and get a better assessment of what's going on. And in the, the gold standard of diagnosis of aortic stenosis is made by echocardiography. And then the most invasive way of doing it is a cardiac catheterization, which we try to avoid unless it's absolutely necessary. <clears throat> Symptomatic severe aortic stenosis isn't really always easy to diagnose. As I said, heart murmurs can go undetected, referrals can be delayed, echocardiographic findings can become misclassified, and a lot of times people just don't recognize their symptoms or don't report their symptoms. The important thing to note is that an earlier diagnosis and earlier treatment typically leads to better outcomes and a better quality of life and overall improved mortality for people. So it's important to you know, report your symptoms and kind of be aware of them as well. This kind of outlines again uh, the underdiagnosis and undertreatment of aortic stenosis over the last several years. Uh, kind of shows that about 40% of patients who need valve replacements for later aortic valve don't get the treatment that they need for various different reasons. This kind of goes over the fact that the mortality difference for people who have a valve replacement procedure versus people who don't get a valve replacement procedure, kind of reemphasizing the point that when people who don't get the valve procedure tend to have poor, poor outcomes and increased mortality compared to people who have a valve replacement procedure who, whose mortalities from a cardiac death uh, improve dramatically. So time to get into a little bit more of, of the detailed treatment options here. So when dealing with aortic stenosis, especially in the year 2023, it's really important to go to a center or go to physicians who can offer you an over, a, a very complex and complete assessment of what's going on. That what we call is a heart team assessment. The heart team is, in, is a combination of various different fields within cardiology that discuss the disease process together and come up with the best treatment plan for aortic stenosis. So what are the treatment options for aortic stenosis? So there are two treatment options for aortic stenosis. The most common and what's been around longer is open heart surgery. You open the chest up and you take the old valve out and you put the new valve in and that's what uh, they've been doing since a very long time. Open heart surgery does have carry uh, significant risk, especially in the elderly population. We're talking about people above the age of 75 or 80, undergoing open heart surgery is a big deal. So now we have more other options, which include transcatheter aortic valve replacement, or TAVR for short, which is what we're gonna discuss. So this is what TAVR is. It's a less invasive option for treatment of severe aortic stenosis basically utilizing a catheter to introduce a valve that will go into your old valve. And we utilize the disease process, which is the calcification of the valve, to anchor these valves into your heart. These are the two different type of valves that exist, one's made by Medtronic and one's made by Edwards Life Sciences. And those are the commercially available valves that we have. 
essentially what happens is that these valves go into the body and the metal frame on the valves, you, they anchor onto the calcium of the valve that's diseased and that's what causes the valve to stay there. There's no stitching involved, there's no you know, um, open heart at all involved. These valves go in through the body of the, the arteries of the body. Average procedure time is about an hour. Um, if you include the time for the anesthesiologist, it's 90 minutes. Um, and the risks of the tower procedure are extraordinarily low. It's 1% where people can experience catastrophic events like stroke or death. So how, how is tower performed? As I mentioned, we, it's a catheter-based procedure. So we access an artery in the groin and take the catheter all the way up to the heart and we put another and put the valve in from the from behind the aorta into the old valve and the new valve goes up. A lot of times people can have significant disease of these arteries. The catheters that we use are fairly large. They're about, you know, the size of yeah, they're fairly large. They're about twice the size of this laser pointer. So you do need to have enough room to get the catheters and the valves through the body. And a lot of times people don't have that. They have a disease, they have blockages or so on and so forth that don't allow us to get the valve up there. So there are many different ways that we can actually do it. We can go in from arteries in the shoulder. We can go directly into the heart from over here. We can take the arteries from the neck and go down to the heart valve as well. So there are many different ways of us getting the valve um, into where it needs to go. So let's go over a video of an actual TAVR procedure. So what's going on here is we're going to basically put a small incision into the femoral artery, which is how we put the valve in. We introduce a sheath, which is fairly large, but we introduce, the, introduce that into the body and park it into the aorta, uh, into the aorta here. The first step is to take a balloon catheter put it through the sheath and track it up through the body. As I mentioned, it goes up the aorta and it goes into the heart from in a backwards fashion. This is a balloon that'll open up the calcified door and while it opens it up, it allows me to have enough room to put the valve in. That balloon comes out and we then put a new valve in. This valve is crimped onto another balloon so that I can actually put the valve in through the arteries. That valve goes up in a similar fashion to the balloon. It goes into the aortic valve, the original valve that was there. And the valve opens up and pushes the old valve aside and the new valve takes its place. This balloon comes down and everything comes out of the body except for the new valve. This new valve opens and closes the way it's supposed to, and the door that was no, that was originally creaky is now replaced. This is an example of the actual tavern procedure in the room. We utilize fluoroscopy to do it. This is the valve. It's in the original valve, which you can see here, and the balloon goes up, and this valve expands and gets anchored into the calcium of the original valve. The balloon comes down, everything comes out except for the valve which stays there. So th that's basically the process of the, of the TAVR procedure. Like I said, it takes about 60 minutes, 60 to 90 minutes to do. It's done in, um, in the hospital, obviously, and we're gonna go over the overall stay for the, after the valve itself. Another aspect of TAVR is, what if you've already had surgery done once, and that surgical valve is no longer working, and there's something wrong with that surgical valve? These are artificial things that we're putting in people's bodies. They do have a durability issue. So if you already have had surgery on yourself for your aortic valve, and that surgical valve is no longer working, and either not opening well or it is closing poorly, an option to replace or fix that failed surgical valve is a tapper. And that's actually the best option that avoids an open heart surgery again. And you have a minimally invasive option of having that valve fixed. The recovery from TAVR is very short. 
basically, once you have the procedure done, you're in the ICU for about one day, 24 hours or an overnight stay. 90% of the people who undergo TAVR are discharged directly from the intensive care unit. Once you're at home, it's about one week of recovery at home. And when we're talking about recovery, I'm not saying bed rest. You're able to walk, you're able to go up and down stairs. We ask you to do limited things, no gardening, no driving a car for about a week. But after that, people usually go back to their activities with better breathing and improved quality of life. So some of the evidence for TAVR to compare to surgery, the overall composite rate, which is the overall rate of mortality when you compare mortality, stroke, and recurrent hospitalizations after the procedure are a lot lower with TAVR than they are with surgery. It's about half of what it is with surgery, at 5% with TAVR and 10% with surgery. The clinical outcomes at 30 days, as you can see in the TAVR arm, are a lot lower than they are in the surgical arm, with the exception of a pacemaker. I mentioned on one slide that surgical valves can fail, and what to do with failed surgical valves is to perform a TAVR. So obviously the next question is, well, what happens to TAVR valves? Do they fail? What's their durability? What's their longevity? We actually just had recent trials that came out in the last year at an eight-year follow-up for patients who've undergone TAVR showing that compared to similar patients who underwent surgery, the overall durability of TAVR was better. The overall rate of the valve failure was around 14% at eight years for TAVR compared to nearly 30% for surgery. The flow across the valves on the TAVR valves have also been a lot better uh, compared to surgery as well at eight years. So our thought process, since the procedure's only been around for 15 years, we, we don't have that long data compared to surgery. But all of our early data shows that TAVR valve durability is actually better compared to their surgical colleagues. So we're gonna switch gears a little bit and talk very briefly about mitral regurgitation. As we mentioned, mitral regurgitation is a failure of the mitral valve from closing properly. As Dr. Alpa mentioned, the valve which has two leaflets that's supposed to close to allow, prevent blood from backflowing from the left ventricle to left atrium can not close properly due to various different reasons. Once it doesn't, there are two different, there are two major types of failure of closure. The first type is called primary mitral regurgitation, where there's an issue with the valve itself. Either the valve's not working properly or something is wrong with the actual anatomy of the valve. A second time is called functional mitral regurgitation. That focuses primarily on heart failure, patients who have heart failure, whose and heart failure by definition is the left ventricle not working properly. The left ventricle, which is the ventricle we mentioned that pumps blood to the whole body, starts to dilate. Once that ventricle starts to dilate, which means getting bigger, the valve can no longer close properly. The leaflets are stretched out and it's kind of like the valve is floating in air when it tries to close, causing leakiness of the blood. In a similar fashion to aortic stenosis, mitral regurgitation also increases mortality for people. Unlike aortic stenosis, mitral regurgitation creates a vicious cycle. Once you have mitral regurgitation, that causes an increased stress on the heart, which then leads to muscle damage and loss, which then leads to the left ventricle not working properly which leads to the heart also dilating and getting bigger, which then ongoingly causes worsening mitral regurgitation and becomes this vicious cycle which is hard to get out of. Unlike aortic stenosis, mitral regurgitation actually has a range of therapies. It can be as simple as medications to as complex as open heart surgery. And the treatment for mitral regurgitation isn't as clear cut as it is for aortic stenosis. It, honestly, it depends on how bad the mitral regurgitation is, how bad the heart is dealing with the mitral regurgitation, and how well you can tolerate medications with mitral regurgitation, which then directs the type of therapy that you would get. So as I said, you can range from medical therapy to mitral valve repair from open heart surgery. What we're gonna talk about is an intermediate step, which is called the mitral clip. The mitral clip is basically a small little clothespin that can help bring those two leaflets that are, no, are floating in the air and kind of clips it together in a minimally invasive way. 
This is what the mitral clip looks like. There are four different types of clip which range in sizes depending on the anatomy that we're talking about. And essentially what it does is it reestablishes the leaflets that aren't closing well and it brings them closer together to prevent the leakiness from happening or at least reduce the leakiness by 50%. And the procedure is done on a beating heart. There's no cardiopulmonary bypass involved. And in a similar way as TAVR is done from the groin, this procedure is done from the artery or the vein that's located in the groin as well. A small video of how this procedure is done. In a similar way, we're actually going through the vein of the body and tracking the catheters up to the heart. We go from the right side of the heart and basically poke a hole from the right side to the left side to get access to the mitral valve. Through this hole, we introduce bigger catheters to allow our system to get in. So we dilate the hole and introduce a sheath, which is a tube that allows us to get our equipment into the heart. And this beating structure is the mitral valve. You can see one leaflet and two leaflets here. We introduce the mitral clip into the heart and we're able to articulate the shoulder down into where the valve is. We bring the valve down and it goes through, the red stuff is the leakiness of the valve. The mitral clip goes into the heart and we slowly bring it back, catching the leaflets into the V-shaped structure here. Once the leaflets are caught, we lock the clip and we close it. The benefit, instead of getting the big gaping hole, you have two smaller holes, reducing the leakiness of the valve. The mitral clip procedure and the apparatus allows us to actually release it if we've not achieved a successful reduction and redo it again multiple times. Once we're happy with the reduction in leakiness, we're able to release the clip and it causes an re overall reduction in leakiness of the valve. In a real-time video, if you look at the bottom lower left on the screen, this is what we were looking at before. You have one leaflet here and one leaflet here. All this color, that's the red and yellow and blue, is a leakiness in a heart. That leakiness is reduced dramatically when you introduce one clip in there. Mitral clip has actually been shown to be guideline recommended instead of surgery for patients who have functional mitral regurgitation. It's been shown that people who have a heart failure and heart failure causing mitral regurgitation do better with mitral clip than they do with open heart surgery. And this kind of shows that as well. The durability of mitral clip, this slide's actually old. This has been updated to five years, most recently about a month ago. But about in five years, mitral clip has reduced heart failure, hospitalizations, and mortality by more than 50%. People who undergo mitral clip for severe mitral regurgitation experience an immediate improvement in their symptoms, and it's shown to have a sustained improvement in overall quality of life. And the mitral clip recovery is very similar to TAVR. You stay in the ICU for about one day. You're in the hospital for a couple more days for the mitral clip than you are with TAVR. You're in the hospital for about one to two days getting diuretics and so on and so forth. And then after three days in the hospital, people usually go home and you're, after one week of taking it easy, you're back to your usual quality of life and usually feel better. And that's pretty much it. I want to know one thing, Dr. Shaw. Did, were, did you play video games as a kid? Because I think that would be part of the routine and training. Right? Yeah, no? yeah, okay. I did. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so we're going to have some questions now. Thanks to our three doctors. Aren't they terrific? Andrew, can I start with one Yes, quick? Dr. Dreisman. I must say, every time I see this, I'm just overwhelmed. As an individual who came here 42 years ago and did the first angioplasty, or part of the team that did the first angioplasty in the state in 81, 82, to see the evolution, there's such tremendous pride going from 
learning you can do a balloon in a coronary artery, to remove clot in a coronary artery, put stents in the coronary arteries, medicated stents, and now to see that we've moved from coronary disease to valvular heart disease, these larger devices, the ability to go in through a groin or is a femoral artery or a femoral vein, go across the septum and really do open heart surgery percutaneously. It's just been an amazing evolution. And to see the young folks come in and take the next thing and the next thing. And we're gonna see a, a natural evolution moving from mechanical, I think, to um, shortly more basically a biologic, but it really is extremely exciting. Let me throw a question at you. There are people here, how do you decide between surgical aortic valve replacement and TAVR? When do you pick, if Bob Altbaum needed an aortic valve and he's 71, maybe, um, <laughs> would, would you give him a surgical valve or a, a TAVR procedure? So that's a really good question. And a really do I have any say? <laughs> do, can I, do I have an opinion on this? Yeah. So that's actually an important point, uh, what Dr. Albaum said, is it, patient preference goes into a lot of what we decide to do, right? Um, a lot of times there are people who would do well with either surgery or TAVR, and we do take patient preference and, you know, patient-directed approach uh, into making a big decision as well. So that, that actually is a very uh, key factor as to what we use to decide. There are other anatomical reasons that we would go down the TAVR route versus a surgical route. Um, Younger patients tend to do, tend to have aortic stenosis due to what we call bicuspid aortic disease, which means that instead of having three leaflets, you have two leaflets in your aortic valve. It's been shown that patients who have two leaflets or bicuspid aortic stenosis still tend to do better with, do better with surgery than they do with TAVR as of now. Trials are still ongoing as to what is the right decision, but as of 2023, with bicuspid aortic stenosis, we would, we would likely choose surgery. And the other aspect of it is, is the younger the patient, we tend to select surgery over TAVR just because of the unknown. We don't know how long TAVR valves will last. Our estimation is that they'll, they will last longer than surgical valves, but we just don't know. And we have more information on surgical valves. So younger patients who are 60, 62, 65 tend to get surgery as opposed to patients 65 or above tend to get, you know, we prefer TAVR. And it really has been an evolution to see what the FDA allowed. Initially, patients had to be severely limited. They had to be unable to undergo open heart surgery. And now we've moved to younger and younger populations. Yeah, I will piggyback on that. That TAVR is actually one of the few devices within the entire field of medicine that's been studied as intently than any other device that's been offered for people. Uh, one, one comment and one question. One comment just to people. Uh, when you have aortic stenosis, you notice that plateau and then the world drops out. Uh, people say, what why can't you use medication? Because it's a mechanical problem and medication does nothing for aortic stenosis. So you'll still die at the same incredibly rapid rate of an average of two years. So the only solution is a mechanical one, replace the valve surgically in the past, TAVR now. One thing I did want to emphasize, I mentioned it before, is age is becoming less of an issue. When I started practice, if you were 85, 90 years old, and that's a common age to have critical aortic stenosis, you were probably out of luck. Uh, very few people wanted to operate on octogenarians. Certainly, nonagenarians were frightening. To operate on, they had a lot of other diseases. This disease, you're in and out in treatment next day, two days later. I was just going to ask, what's the oldest person you've done a TAVR on? The oldest person I've done a TAVR on is 99. 99. It's an astonishing technology. How's he doing? <laughs> <laughs> this was three years ago. Wow. <laughs> it's such a good fix. We used to say you're never too old for surgical aortic valve. Now with TAVR, we say you're never too old for a, a TAVR. Amazing. So uh, do we have some questions? Uh, again, once again, if you can go over by where Alex is standing there in front of the Westport sign. Right here, please, if you have questions. Oh, great. Anyone else? No questions? I think. Oh, yes. We, we have answered all. We've anticipated all their questions, Alex, and there's nothing to do. 
you could just uh, repeat the question because we're being taped here. How, how, many how many tavers can you do? How many tavers can you do in one procedure? I, 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 uh, I, I guess I'm not understanding the question. I mean, how many tavers? Oh, how many? Oh, you can. So right now, we one individual can likely have two tavers. So you can have a taver at, let's say, 70. And if that valve lasts you up until 85, we can do another taver at that point. There have been people who have had three or four tavers done as well, which is not ideal, but technically feasible. Yes, sir. Okay. Um, uh, I was diagnosed with, <clears throat> switching back over to the mitral valve, I was diagnosed with uh, uh, mit mitral uh, regurgitation at age 25, monitored it for many years, and then in uh, the year 2000, uh, 25 years later, I, uh, uh, I had uh, the mitral valve repaired. Uh, two questions. One is, in light of the clip, do they still do uh, repairs? Uh, and second one is, should my valve uh, deteriorate? And I also had the, uh, uh, the ring, Cosgrove ring installed at that time. Would I be a candidate for the clip? So to answer the first question, so mitral valve repair is definitely something that we do right now. And is it, um, is it uh, through catheterization now or not? As of right now, mitral valve repair in a fashion that you've likely had is still done with open heart. There are alternatives to a traditional sternotomy, which is an open heart down the chest, where we can do mitral valve repair through a small incision yeah, between your I ribs. Had. Right, so we can do that. We, in some surgeons, will utilize the Da Vinci robot to do that procedure as well. And unlike aortic stenosis and TAVR, mitral regurgitation really, is, it, there's no concrete, solid answer. It really depends on multiple different variables as to which, which treatment option is best. Um, so it's not always a, if A, then B for mitral regurgitation as it is as clear cut for aortic stenosis. Um, and to answer your second question, it, if you've had mitral valve repair once, your options for if something were to happen, which it can, anything can happen, uh, which is why it needs to be monitored, um, options to fix that can include mitral clip, but there are other devices that are out there or on the horizon that would be better options. Okay, so I should wait before it goes bad on me, right? <laughs> I would wait as long as you can. Okay. <laughs> Just okay. One, one additional point on that. We still say mitral valve repair is one of the few things that are really a complete fix. Mitral valve repair is the gold standard. You're the example of it. You had it yeah. 25 years ago, a good repair, a good repair can last forever, can certainly last many decades. Um, and so it's still, whereas clipping is more of a simple fix for someone who has a, it, it's, it's not a true fix, it's a good alternative. Would you agree? Yeah, exactly. The clip is more reserved for patients who cannot undergo repair uh, <coughs> in a setting of the type of mitral anatomy you have. If you have severe congestive heart failure where the heart is extraordinarily dilated, causing you to have mitral regurgitation, that inherently puts you at a higher risk for open heart surgery, which is when you start going down the mitral clip route. <coughs> okay, thank you. Um, yeah, I'm not asking a personal question, more of a cultural question. When you show the example of if you've had the surgery um, versus not having the surgery, I'm just curious, is that a function of privilege or just, I mean, because this must be very expensive in terms of you have to have insurance or... Um, something, some way, means to support mm. this. So I'm just curious if... I have to answer Anne, because I've known Anne for how long? You were my children's second grade teacher, second yeah, grade? Right, right. Yes. <laughs> um, and I remember your dad also well. Um, but no, it's not a matter of privilege. In our society now, we do everything for everybody. It's irrelevant whether you have the finest insurance or you have Medicaid or Medicare. You, we virtually never look at that, and it's, to, so it's not a 
privilege. Chirag will, and those of us who refer to Chirag, will become the best procedure for the totally respective of any insurance. What I will say to add on to that is that, I mean, again, the aortic stenosis is a disease process of the elderly. So it's very uncommon for someone under the age of 65 to have severe aortic stenosis needing repair. While not impossible, very uncommon. So most patients who do have severe aortic stenosis that do need TAVR or even open heart surgery uh, tend to have Medicare. Um, and this is fully approved by Medicare. Oh, I see. Oh, great, 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 thank you. This is just a question of curiosity. The illustrations are in, I have to flip my mind each time I watch them. The left, the left ventricle is on the right side, et cetera. Is there a reason why, I mean, is, is there some benefit to doing it that way? I'm not sure. I fully understand the right ventricles on the right side of the heart, the left ventricles on the left side of the heart as we face this way. So it's, uh, that's truly, and this is embryologic, whether you're evolving from a fish to a frog to a ape to a human, it's um, what we deal with and what we've learned to repair. No, it's what I'm saying is when you look at the illustrations that are shown, the left is on the right. You're looking from is, this side. Is there some reason? Well, it's just you're the... looking at the patient as opposed to being the patient. Being the patient. This is how we observe the patient. All right. the, 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 the easiest way to answer that, the easiest way to answer that question is that the way that we're taught in medical school is not to look directly at, it is to pretend the patient is on the screen or the textbook. So if you're looking at someone, it's a mirror image, right? Your right side is gonna be, your own left side is gonna be on my right side. So that's how radiology images work. That's, yeah. Yeah. that's how radiology images work. That's how CAT scans, x-rays, so on and so forth work. That's just how we've been taught. So that's how it's depicted. All right, thank you. This is a, a personal question. I'm trying to um, evaluate uh, a situation. My wife did go through mitral valve repair, um, and it was um, a repair of the the strands that that uh, attached the, from the leaflet to the to the muscle, and there was regurgitation. The, the heart was enlarging. The uh, the uh, operation was a technical success. Um, the issue I'm faced with is that apparently it was a wonderful success because. We did it when the heart enlarged to the point where they said, now is the time to do this. Post the surgery, uh, her heart essentially shrunk further than what they had anticipated. So the, the heart size shrunk further. They now say she has the size of a child's heart. The downside of that is that, it, that the regurgitation, because the heart is now smaller than they thought it was, and the ring that they replaced in there, there is still a modest amount or a small amount of regurgitation. I, I, I'm, I was dissatisfied with the post-op um, recovery procedure that the hospital recommended. There was essentially none. And now I'm faced with the problem where what my, my wife, post the surgery, is still concerned. Um, and I, I wonder, it, it's getting better, my question is exercise. Does exercise in that condition, is it still good or is it still not? Because she'll walk now and still get out of breath, but I don't know whether or not that's because she hasn't done any exercise in the two years since the operation, or does it have something to do with the heart still? Uh, that's a really difficult question to answer without more information. We'd have to take a look at all the echocardiograms and so on and so forth to get a better answer for that question. And I, I honestly, with that much information, I can't give you a legitimate answer. I'm, I'm sorry. It's possible there are a number of causes, whether it turns into a hypertrophic situation, but you need good assessment, and I'm sure your cardiologists are doing that, or alternate cardiologists can. And in terms of exercise, That's the cardiac rehabilitation um, facilities we have locally are really wonderful. So I presume she partook in cardiac rehabilitation no. post-op, but she certainly should. She should. That, that, my basic question is, does exercise in that scenario, is that 
bad or good or monitored exercise with the appropriate exercise physiologists that are available is usually very useful. Yes, sir. Uh, this is sort of just a curiosity question. I don't have any heart issues that I know of. But um, <laughs> when you do the Tabor procedure, how do you, or how does the valve, the new valve, open and close? What's, what's stimulating the opening and closing? Yeah, it's a really good question. It opens and closes the same way your own valve does right now. Yeah. The valves, all the valves in the heart open and close due to pressure differentials within the heart itself. So when the pressure in the left ventricle is greater than the pressure in the aorta, the valve opens. Sure. And once the pressure in the ventricle drops below the pressure in the aorta, the valve closes, all pressure differentials. The TAVR valves that we put in work the same way. They work with the pressure differential in the heart. When the pressure goes up, the valve will open, and when the pressure goes down, the valve will close. It's not an electrical stimulation, it's all pressure. Yeah, it's all, it's all the same way that the current valves open and close. Thank you. Hmm. Curious to know what the material of the Tarver valve is that it flops, closes, and opens as you described. That's a great question, too. Um, so the TAVR valves are all man-made valves. Um, they're either made, in de depending on which brand you use, either in Michigan or California. Um, and the outer frame of the valve, if you remember, there's a metal frame. That frame is usually a nitinol or a nickel, which is what nitinol is. And the leaflets themselves, which are the things that open and close, they're made from animal tissue. So not a valve from an animal, but they take tissue from either a pig or a cow, a heart tissue from a pig or a cow, and utilize that to hand make those valves. Thank you. Can I ask one more? Yes. I, I promise. But, um, what causes the aortic valve to uh, be malfunctioning? Is it hereditary? Is it the stenosis sort of thing? Or what, what's going on there? Yes, another great question. Uh, the cause of aortic stenosis is usually, a lot of times it is hereditary. Uh, it runs in families that we've noticed as well. Um, and sometimes it's just kind of the hand that you're dealt. It's calcium deposition on the valve, which then progresses over time. It's kind of, the valve becomes degenerative. You, it beats six, at minimum 60 beats per minute for however long you've lived. Just like when your knee gives out for arthritis, a similar fashion, the valve eventually degenerates over time. Do you usually see, another question, do you usually see calcium, that's part of the issue? If there's no calcium, you're not gonna have an issue with the valve, or is there other reasons as well? Traditionally speaking, in the US, it's calcium deposition on the valve that will cause it to become stenotic. Uh -huh. There are other reasons, which typically we don't see in the US, um, but there are other reasons why you can have the valve not open well. You said that earlier, I forgot. Thank you. Totally. Great. Any other questions? Well, that brings us to a close of, um, Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, my question is heart murmurs. Um, if you have an heart murmur, heart murmur, and the doctor is not concerned, the cardiologist is not concerned, and it's been there for years and years, and all the proper tests are done, what does that mean? Because now you have me have a great big question mark regarding heart murmurs, the way you described it versus the way my cardiologist sees it. So heart murmurs are typically caused by an issue with one of the valves. They right. can, so that's why you have a heart murmur. As long as it's monitored and assessed in an appropriate fashion and your cardiologist is not worried about it, it, it just needs to be continued to be monitored. People can have heart murmurs from mild valve disease. All the things that we discussed today is when the mild disease extends from mild to severe, causing problems, okay. which can, can still happen if you have a mild heart murmur as you, as you get older. Um, so it, it just needs to be continued to be monitored. It's been there for about 25, 30 years. And you should continue to monitor for another 25 to 30 years. Okay. Thank you. Great. Right. We have one, we more? Have time for one more? Sure. Sorry. Um, you, we've talked about calcium deposits, calcification, et cetera. So as a woman who's 50 plus now, and I doubt primary care is saying, build up on the calcium, take super supplements, do this, whatever. Are the two connected? 
That's another great question. Uh, so the, the short answer is no. The calcium levels that are in your body or taking extra calcium is not what causes calcium deposition in the heart. Um, the first lecture where Dr. Pollock spoke about coronary artery disease, that also causes calcification as well. The calcification that develops on the heart, either the arteries or the valves or what have you, is usually secondary to inflammation, which is secondary to irritation by something. For coronary disease, it's, complete, it's something completely different. And for valvular heart disease, it really is just, it, it's genetic. Uh, you can, if you start developing calcium due to some genetic issue with it, that can progress over time. But it has nothing to do with taking calcium supplements, calcium intake, milk, dairy products, et cetera. Okay, good, thank you. Fascinating. Um, well, as I started to say, I wanna thank our three wonderful doctors here. Dr. Dreisman, Dr. Shaw, and Dr. Albaum. Uh, so, we're gonna continue uh, a medical series. Dr. Albaum and I were discussing today what we, what we might go and do next. Um, so, when we're still trying to decide, but we'd love your thoughts as well. So, if you have an idea, something you'd like us to cover, uh, this is a great series, and uh, I think uh, I think it's a great series. I think we should continue this, and what's the next topic? That's the only question we have. So come and see us afterwards. But thank you so much for coming. Uh, and no, there's no test. Thanks. <laughs> Good night. <laughs>